Five ways to create a ultra megapixel panorama. Hi, I'm Joel Grimes with the Joel Grimes Academy. I'm gonna show you five ways you can create ultra megapixel panoramas. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, no matter what megapixels you have, so I have a couple cameras, but my biggest camera is my 5DSR, which is 50 megapixels. Pretty good size camera, but I have clients that are pretty demanding. So I have uh, recently did a big project where they had, and they actually, I saw the prints later, they were 20 feet wide. So that's a big, big file. And so I did some things to help increase my megapixels. It's not unheard of for me to create a file that is a 350 plus megapixel capture. Not only can I get more megapixels, I can also do a, a really cool panorama look or not just even uh, from left to right, but I can go up and down to make bigger files this way. The first way I would say is the easiest way is to take a longer lens. Say like, I have my 7200 here, the uh, Canon 2.8 version two lens. And so I can, let's say I have, um, I don't do weddings, but let's just say there was a beautiful bride underneath a big gorgeous tree and the light's absolutely perfect. And I can go and I can frame her. I go usually horizontal and I would snap in the middle of framing her perfectly. And then I can go and I can move left and right and snap some more pictures as quick as I can go. Usually I'm gonna be shooting at a shallow depth of field so I get that kind of soft bokeh look. Or if you wanna not have her centered, you might go uh, a lot left and maybe a little bit right, either way. And then you go and you put those together in Photoshop and Photo Merge and you get this crazy, beautiful 200 millimeter depth of field look but with a wider angle of view so really what you're doing is you're producing a lens that does not exist on the planet in one capture so i've been doing that for years it's really fun it gives uh, my work a look that maybe people go and scratch your head and say how did you do that i like that when people kind of say that's something i've never seen before and as a photographer who's branding myself in the marketplace, that's a great thing to do is have people look and say, I want an image like that. So that's handheld. And the reason why you can get away with that is it's a long lens. Can't do that with a wide angle. Now, there are some programs out there that like say PT GUI, which are really good when you have some issues that will solve it where, where Photo Merge and Photoshop says, no, mm, I don't like it. PT GUI might solve that, but still with a wide angle lens, not a good idea to go handheld and stitch an image. So well, let's go to the next step. All right, so number two, you can take and put your 7200 or with a lens that has a collar mount and you can put it so that you're spinning your camera, not on the base of your, your camera, but on the lens itself. Now I, you can test the nodal point on this and it's pretty darn close. Um, and you can slide it a little bit this way and this way, right? But with a, with a, say, 200 millimeter mark uh, focal length, it's not that critical. It's, it, you can pretty much stitch it together and you'll never know, right? So just pop it on there, do my pop, 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 pop across. So a lot of my images that I've shot in the past, I've done tutorials on, and I'm actually showing how I do this. And it's really fun. You get this crazy 300 megapixel capture and a super shallow depth of field. And again, it's all done by, again, me shooting on a tripod. So I hardly ever do this handheld. So that's number two. That's a great way to do it. It's a cheap way to do it. And you already have basically the setup, if you have a tripod, to do it. It doesn't have an extra cost involved. All right, well now we're on number three. This requires a tilt shift lens. I do a lot on this. I've been using the tilt shift lenses for a long time now. I now own three of them. If I can talk my wife into another, I'll have four soon. So I have the 17, 24, and the 90. So I want the 50. I've tested it, it's incredible. The 90 is also amazing. And so here's how I do that. So I have the ability to shift this left and right. So on a, this is uh, the 5D Mark IV, but on my 5D SR, if I go left and right, I get about an 80 megapixel capture and the end when I stitch it all together. And this camera, I'd probably end up with about a 50 megapixel. If I go and uh, do it this way, or I'll spin it like this, I'll do like an up, a middle, and a down. That gives me more like a four by the old four by five format, so it's not quite squared up, but it's a little bit um, you know longer on top and bottom. That I'll do like a lot of 
landscape stuff or portraits. I do portraits too. I stitch it. And so that gives me about 110 to 20 megapixel capture on the final. So last summer I spent 100 days on the road shooting Harley Davidson's across America. Um, I probably did uh, over 100 portraits. I shot all the portraits either with a tilt shift lens because um, I didn't get those until the end of the project or I did my nodal point. I'll show you that in a minute. I did three captures and so I have these 60 by 90 inch prints of my Harley riders. I mean, that is huge. And when I print them out on a big wide format printer, I print at 200 DPI and there is none, zero interpolation in terms of going up in resolution. That's native resolution out of my file from Photoshop and they look unbelievable. Your, your jaw will hit the floor, they're so gorgeous. And so that's why I go to the extra uh, effort to go and do something like this. So you can do that with the nodal point, I'll show you that in a minute, but or with a tilt shift lens. So this is a great way to increase your megapixels or like I said, do panoramas. Left, right, that gives me a long beautiful panorama. So you'll look at my portfolio, uh, joelgrimes.com, I have a lot of panoramas shot with these tilt shift lenses. So, um, or that stitching like I said, doing a really long, maybe five to six images will give me a long panorama. And those, like I said, get huge files. Number four, this is uh, a system that I started with probably 15 years ago. So here is the nodal plate right here. You can see I got a piece of, uh, I've got a piece of uh, paper stuck to that. It's actually like a sticky, you know, like a label. I just stuck it on there, trimmed it up. That's all my nodal points. I'll explain that in a minute. That's my reference when I'm in the field, so I don't have to, you know, do the nodal point on the field, which I've done in the past. Um, and then this goes on here. I take my camera, and usually what I'm doing is I'm running it uh, vertical. I line it up here, so I have my, my little two marks line up here. And then I look at my lens. This is the 24 to 70. Uh, let's say it's 35 millimeter. Let's just say that's my focal length. I want to go across there. I look down here, and I say uh, 35 millimeter. That's at my mark 5.3. I lock it down, there's my nodal point. Since you'll see I'm on really right stuff, tripod. This is actually my little teeny tripod, so I probably would be using my bigger tripod if I did this. This is when I go backpacking or I really don't wanna go heavy. Doesn't matter, the ball head's the same in terms of, it's bigger ball head, but it doesn't matter. This is what's important right here, this rail. And I have this L bracket on the back of here, which is from really right stuff. That allows me to go and mount this all up. So I've had this rig for at least 15 years, this rail, and I bought it before there was a program to even stitch uh, Mac uh, on the Mac side. I think on PC side there was a program, very crude program. So I ended up buying this rig. I had at the time the 1DS, the Canon 1DS, 11 point whatever two megapixel uh, capture, and I ended up stitching those images to get bigger megapixels. At the time, I was doing fine art, uh, black and white cactus stuff out in the desert. Uh, that stuff ended up in Arizona Highways Magazine. I've, show, sh I've sold a lot of those prints. That was one way for me at that time to get an increased megapixel because I wanted some beautiful resolution images. And so I, I stitched them all by hand. Now we have easy peasy times, right? With, with Photo Merge and PT GUI programs like that, it'll stitch it together really simple. So on a wide angle, when you get to the wide angle uh, uh, focal lengths, you want to make sure you have your nodal point. Now, I'm not gonna explain the nodal point right now how to get it. If you go to reallyrightstuff.com, they have a whole tutorials on how to do that. Very simple, it's not hard, it's not rocket science. It's basically taking two points, I take a light stand and I take something in the background like a beam or something and I line it all up and what I do is I rock it back and forth and I slide it until the light stand and or whatever stick or whatever is in front of my lens does not do this. They go and they stop and so when you turn it you're not there's not moving back and forth. Very simple to do. Make the mark, and then later in the field I can go to it. That's number four. It's not that expensive. This rail here's about 100 plus, 110, 20 dollars. I'm not sure exactly. It's been so long. With inflation, who knows? Maybe it's 140 now. Um, this L bracket, depending on what model you have, what camera you're putting on, should be about 180 bucks. Um, but this gives it a super, super heavy duty platform. In fact, Wyatt and I were talking about this today. This mount here 
gives me a lot more stable than one little teeny plate on the bottom of my camera. So if you want some really stable, uh, you know, non-vibration, you know, to your camera, this mount is probably the best mount you could possibly get to do that. Or a mount like it. I love the Really Right Stuff people. They're great and they, I think they make uh, incredible products. That's the, I would call the poor man uh, railing system for doing basically one sets of rows. You, won't, you don't want to do multiple rows with this rig right here. It's usually one set of rows. Almost all the time, I'm doing it in this position right here. It's pop, 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 across like that. All right, number five. This is it, the Big Daddy. Um, this is not for everyone, but I'm gonna show you. I love this rig. This is the Really Right Stuff Pano Head three-way axis. And so this allows you to go multiple rows. I don't think I've ever done more than maybe four, four, four. Usually it's three, 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 somewhere around there. There are some people that go crazy and they go uh, obviously uh, stitch more than that. Um, if I do a three rows, three, 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 I usually, if I do my overlapping right, I run a 300 megapixel capture. It's a pretty big file and my, my computer starts smoking, you know, when I put it together. So uh, that gives me enough. But let me show you how that works. Let's say I have, um, a Harley Davidson in front of me, which I did last summer, and I shot a number of those with this rig. I'll shoot the bike, and usually in that case, I did this. I would shoot my bike, so I'd frame up my bike so that the Harley Davidson was perfectly in this one frame. Then I would go to the left, fire frame, to the right, fire frame, then I'd go above, and I'd usually get just a, a little bit of the, maybe the handlebars in there, go three across that way. And then I would go maybe three on the ground, or if I wanted a beautiful sky, I'd go three across that. So I get really top, the, the bikes on the bottom of the frame. So I'd get my three rows. I'm also doing HDR in the middle of all that. So I'm getting three times, uh, th uh, let's see, so nine times uh, three. And then my strobing, I strobe the bike. So when I go back to this position, I would do the middle, just the bike itself, all strobed, and then I'd put it all together in Photoshop. It takes me about an hour to do that. It's a little bit time consuming, but the end result is off the charts. We'll put one of the images in there to show you what I did. Uh, it's the Harley Davidson shot at the Magic Beach Hotel. And again, that was run, oh, Adobe ran that in one of their trade shows at eight by 10 feet. And so Canon also put it in their, uh, their lobby or their gallery at one of the trade shows uh, in New York and it was about a 60 inch something print. It was beautiful. So that gives me the ability to go and create number one, a lens that does not uh, have, uh, or that's not on the planet in terms of in one capture because if you're increasing your angle of view when you stitch. Basically what you're doing is you're creating a sensor that's bigger. Not only am I making a bigger sensor than any medium format camera on the market, I would probably say it's bigger than a four by five uh, piece of film. The sensor gets bigger than that. It uh, depends on how many you know rows you do, but it is a huge high resolution capture. And so that's how I do it. And there's a lot more information you can learn on this. And I do in the Jewel Grinds Academy. I have all this covered, folks. I love it. I love to get big prints. And of course, if you want to do the gallery thing or you're working for advertising clients like I do, the demand is super high. This is how I do it. All right, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that little bell. And then of course, you're always caught up with all my current content.